unfolding the eternal excellences, the hidden insights of the truth and the depth of the riches of wisdom and knowledge. The Bible says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have not pointed to your weaknesses. He says, I have cleansed thee by the word. I have pointed to your strength. And this is your strength, that I am Christ in you, the hope of glory. The glory of freedom, the glimpses into eternity. The gospel is not supposed to be an assumption. It's not supposed to be just a mere presupposition. Truth is older than language, but the word of God is way deeper than any human language. And now, Apostle Grace with the word. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So today, I felt led and compelled by the Holy Spirit to you know, share a life of a man that I've read about before in scripture. And of course, from which light do I share? In Corinthians. The Bible tells us chapter 10 and verse 6. He says, now these things are our examples. Hallelujah. To the intent that we should not last after evil things as they also lasted. There are things in scripture that are examples for you, for your learning. Somebody shout hallelujah. God has put certain things in the word, not necessarily for your experience. Hello? But they're for your learning. Not everything in scripture is for experience. You don't need to get a, a messenger to buffet you for you to learn. No, Paul taught you. Praise God. And that's why when he goes in verse 11, he says, and all these things happen to them. Yeah? For examples. There are things that happen for your teaching and there are also things that happen in scripture to men and women of God for your teaching. There are events that happen without man necessarily for your teaching. And there are also events that happen to men and women of God in scripture for your teaching. I hope you understand what I mean. They are simply examples. They are simply things that you have to look by and through for you to live a more successful life than the man you're reading about. It does not necessarily mean that you have to undergo the life and suffering of that man that you've read about. But it means that you can learn certain things. Like I said, an example, when Paul says, and to keep me from getting puffed up from the abundance of the revelation that was in me, he sent a messenger to buffet me. That means that Paul had an issue of reconciling just how much he had and to balance it to remember that he was in the flesh. God had to send a messenger of Satan to buffet him, lest he should be exalted above measure because of the abundance of revelation. 2018, because of the abundance of revelation, you don't need a messenger to buffet you. God is simply telling you, the more you know, the more you humble. These are simply examples for you that should believe after to tell you that the more God reveals to you, the more you humble. The more God reveals through you, the more you humble. The more God works through you, the more you humble. The more miraculous you see in your life, the more you humble. The more money that increases, the Bible says when wealth increases, when riches increases in Proverbs, he says, set not your mind on them. Some people become... Get some money. You're humble now because you don't have enough. The day you get money, we are in trouble. You're like this because, <laughs> yeah, you understand? Because you hope maybe somebody will hand over something to you. Praise God. But the Bible says, if riches increase, he says, set not your heart upon them. What does that mean? That be as rich as can, but still be a normal person. Be approachable. Come out of your Lamborghini and then shake hands with people. Eat with the poor. You understand? Yes, you can still sit in a cheap restaurant. It doesn't change you. So you say, I oh, know that's not my class. I can't sit there anymore. I, no, oh, oh. when you start doing that, you're on your way to failing. Because pride goes before a fall. Praise God. So that's the essence of the word. It either will bring events and examples of examples of things that have happened for your teaching or certain things will happen to men of God or will happen in the lives of men of God for your teaching, not for your experience. Somebody shout hallelujah. And for such today in 2 Chronicles chapter 14, I want to introduce you to a man called Asa or Asa. The Bible says in verse 1, Abijah slept with his fathers and they buried him in the city of David and Asa, his son, reigned in his stead in the days of the land, and the land was quiet for 10 years. That means when Asa became king, the land had peace for 10 years. Somebody shout hallelujah. No attacks from the enemy, no 
eventual circumstances coming of plagues and sickness and diverse diseases and tumults and trials. No, the land was peaceful and quiet for 10 years. And the Bible says, And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord, his God, for he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and broke down the images and cut down the groves. And he commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and commandment. Also, he took out all the cities of Judah, high places and images, and the kingdom was quiet before him. There was peace. The Bible says he built first cities, for the land had rest, and he had no war in those years, because the Lord had given him rest. Therefore, he said unto Judah, let us build these cities and make about them walls, towers, gates, and bars, while the land is yet before us, because we've sought the Lord our God, we've sought him, and he has given us rest on every side, so they built and prospered. See, that's the testimony of a man who seeks God. You have rest on your side. Somebody shout hallelujah. You have prosperity in your life. You can't seek God and be broke. Hey, tell your neighbor, you cannot seek God and be broke. Turn to the other neighbor too and tell them you cannot seek God and be broke. You cannot seek God and not have peace in your boundaries. Did I mean that they will not attack you? No, no, no. If they attack, there's a way God will, will tranquilize them to a place where they will not have effect or consequence on your life. Somebody said hallelujah. That is the portion that God has given you. There is peace in my house. Somebody say there is peace in my house. Say there is peace in my borders. There is peace everywhere that I am. He says he even sets, when a man's ways are right with God, he says he even sets your enemies at peace with you. It doesn't mean that they stop hating you. It means they can hate you, but they still have peace with you. There is nothing they can do to you, even though they hate you. Can somebody shout hallelujah? And that was the life of Asa. And the Bible says he had an army that bare targets and spears out of Judah 300,000 and out of Benjamin that bare shields drew bows 204 score thousand, 204 score thousand, 280,000. All of these were mighty men of valor. 10 years of peace because the man knew God. 10 years of prosperity because the man knew God. Somebody shout hallelujah. And now the Bible tells us, one day, a certain fellow, Zerah the Ethiopian, which was a host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots, came unto Meresha. That is a guy, he had more than a million people, a mi more than a million of an army. Remember, this guy has 580,000. And there is an attack of an enemy that has come to him with more than a million Soldiers, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And Asa cried, the Bible says, and Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of Zephathah at Maresha. And Asa, the man of God, cried unto the Lord his God and said, Listen, listen to this. He says, It is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord. He knew how God works. He knew that this God doesn't need you to have an army. He knew that this God doesn't need you to be many to win. He knew that the majority doesn't need to win necessarily. Do you understand what I'm saying? If you have set a man to rule, he doesn't need, even if the majority don't support him, he has set up that man. He says, he told him, look, with you there is nothing with you to help, whether there are many or with them that have no power. You don't even need power for God to help you. He can help you even when you're powerless. That is the God I know. So this man looks at 580,000 people. That's close about slightly above half a million. And there is a million of an army. Even if you say one man simply kill one man the other side. They would still win the war. And the Bible says. This man tells God help us. Oh Lord our God. For we rest on you. We don't rest on our ability. We don't rest on our influence. We don't rest on our wisdom. We don't rest on our connections. We don't rest on those who know, those who don't know us. We don't rest on, on who knows us in government and in police and anywhere. No, we rest on you, the man of God says. He says, help us. Somebody shout hallelujah. And what does the Bible say? And the Bible says, and in thy name, the Bible says, we go against this multitude. Oh Lord, thou art our God, let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord 
smote the Ethiopians before Asa. Why? Because the man tells him in that last line, O oh Lord, thou art our God, let no man prevail against you. You see? That's the language. Because anybody that fights you fights God. Somebody shout hallelujah. Anything that sets itself against you fights God. And then he says, don't let man prevail over you. And the next verse says, truly, the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah and the Ethiopians fled. Asa was the king then of Judah. Israel had split. There was the general Israel of the ten tribes and the Judah of two. And Asa was the king of Judah during that time. And God hit them and they smote all the cities around Gera. For the fear of the Lord came upon them and they spoiled all the cities. For there were exceeding much spoil of them. They smote all the tents. In the 15th verse, because of that victory, the spirit of the Lord came upon Azariah, the son of Obed, and the Oded, and he went out to meet Asa and said unto him, Hear ye, O Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin, the Lord is with you while ye be with him. You understand? The Lord is with you while you be with him. Like in James 4, 8, where he says, Draw to God and he shall draw near to thee. Let me also correct this before I go. Let me, let me probably state this clearly before I go deeper. In the New Testament dispensation, he never leaves us. Are you hearing me? He never leaves us because his love toward us is unconditional. But his power can be frustrated if we don't know how to yield to him. It ain't mean that God has left you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. He promised you. He's the friend that sticks closer than a brother. He abideth with you forever by his spirit. But you have a choice to yield to that power and the spirit. Or you have a choice to ignore that life. Because the Bible tells us yielding falsifieth offense. When you learn to draw nigh to God. Through what? Through the reading of the word. Through what? Through your life. Your personal life of prayer. Your personal life of, of just loving on him. Relating with him as Jehovah God. Everybody deserves that. You cannot live a life of Christianity when you don't know how to pray. You can't live a life of Christianity when you don't sit under the word. You can't live a life of Christianity when you don't have a time to worship your God. Who is understanding what I'm saying? Now the Bible says in the verse third, Now for a long season Israel has been without the true God and without teaching and priest and without law. But when in that travel did they turn unto the Lord God of Israel and sought him and was found by them. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. He was found by them. Somebody shout hallelujah. So, because of that, in those days, the fifth verse says, in those times there was no peace to him that went out, nor to him that came in, but great vexation upon all the inhabitants of the countries, and the nation was destroyed of the nation and city of the city, for God did vex them with all adversity. Be ye strong therefore, now he's, he's trying to tell him the power of God, right? He tells him, be ye strong therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And the Bible tells us, and Asa had these words, and the prophecy of ordered the prophet, he took courage and put away all the abominable idols. He was trying to tell him, look, he's the God who can, you know, if any nation disobeyed him, you know, the worst scenario could happen. Anything, disaster would hit that nation. But, him, but you see, you have a reward with God, Asa. You have a God you've believed in. You've chosen to walk with God. You're, you've made a choice to, to make him your God. Now, believe in him. He shall reward you. He shall walk with you. When Asa hears that prophecy, the Bible says he gave, he let go of, of what? Of all the idols. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he gathered himself to the spare of serving God. He simply carried out a place of saying, you know what, because this has come from God, I'm going to renew the altar of the Lord and the porch of the Lord. He strengthened every part that is of the Lord and then he continued, the Bible says, in peace. Praise the Lord. In the 19th verse, the Bible says, there was no more war unto the five and thirtieth year of the reign of Asa. For 35 years of his reign, he never saw war. There was peace. Somebody shout hallelujah. And you, you know, the spirit of the Lord was talking to me today. Let me share something. I, maybe I didn't plan to, to even share it. The, th the number 35 means hope. Right? And I realized also that the number 34 means promise. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. 34 means promise. Hope comes... Okay, maybe let me explain it. Ephesians chapter 5. Praise the Lord. 
34 means hope, right? 33 means promise, sorry. And 32 means covenant. And when I was studying it, it was so amazing that that is exactly what happens in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11, when he says, Wherefore remember that ye being in past times Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands, that at the times you are without Christ being alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, listen, strangers from the covenants, that is 32, of the promise, that is 33, and having no hope, which is 34, who is understanding? Or I explain it. Okay, let me explain. 34 is the number meaning hope, right? 33 is the number meaning promise. And 32 is the number meaning covenant. He says, you need a covenant to establish a promise. And that's the promise that gives you hope. Who is understanding what I'm saying? Because without that hope, you're useless. There, there is... There is nothing to it. And that's what he's saying in Ephesians, that they were strangers from the covenants, which come first. That is the number 32, right? And then of the promise, which is the number 33, having no hope, which is the number 34. And without a God in this world, the number 35 actually is the number of the enemy. That means that it represents in scripture the number of the enemy. When they say 35, that then that's the number that represents the enemy. When they say, when you dream 35, ooh, enemy. Praise God. So, when I was reading and I realized that literally God is so smart that he's telling you, because of the covenant you have, you have obtained promises. And because of the promises that you have, by this you have hope. And when you have hope because of the promises of the covenant you're under, you're guaranteed peace. Those are the 34 years that Asa has of peace. In the 35th year, that's the end of the peace. Praise God. In the 36th year, an attack comes in Chronicles chapter 16. You'll understand why I'm explaining this. In the 6th and 36th year of the reign of Asa, there was a king in Israel called Basha. Basha came upon against Judah. He's the king of Israel. Something tells him, you know what? There were enemies, of course, with Judah. And then he... He gets the idea that, you know what, build a city just almost at the edge of Judah so that nobody else can access Judah. And then he wanted to name that city Ramah, right? And indeed, he started building that city to frustrate Judah. At that time, he didn't want anybody to come in to bring, say, business and commerce to Judah. You know, Judah needed food. They needed gold. They needed silver. They needed to do business. But when you build a city around them, and then uh, uh, yes, a city around them, and then you fortify it, it means nobody can access Judah. That means that they would either die of starvation or they would suffer from poverty. It was more like alienating them. It was more like putting an embargo, like nations put embargoes on other nations or sanctions. Who understands what I'm saying? Follow me. Now the scriptures tell us this man who knows God, who understands God, who fears the Lord, he enters into a certain space where Israel is fighting him. The scriptures tell us he goes to the king of Syria and tells him, you know what? I've gotten the gold and silver from the temple and anything that is needed. Let me give it to you right now and help me frustrate who? The king of? Israel. Now the king of Syria buys the deal. And he says, okay, I'm going to frustrate this guy. So they start frustrating Basha, the king of Israel. When they start frustrating Basha, the king of Israel, that was opportunity for Asa to go to the foundations of the city which Basha was trying to build and then break it. So he started breaking it and then messing it up. Praise God. Eventually, there was victory over Israel under Basha because the Syrians Ben Haddad had helped him to destroy who? Basha. Now, verse 7 tells us at that time, Hanani the seer comes to Asa, the king, and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. What does that mean? God that day tells Asa, that because you relied on the host of Syria to defeat Israel, instead of relying on God, now the power that you had over Syria has ended. You will never defeat Syria. It will always be above you. How then would Esau go to Ben-Hadad of Syria 
to ask him to fight for him a war of Israel unless he knew that Ben Hadad had a huge army too. Are you hearing me? And the next verse says, Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host? He's now reminding us of what happened in 14. He says, when they very many with chariots and horsemen, yet because you did rely on the Lord, he delivered them in thine hand. For the Lord, or the eyes of the Lord, ran to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Wherein, herein, thou hast done foolishly. Therefore, from thenceforth, thou shalt have woes. From that day, Asa opened up a door, firstly, to have wars for the rest of his life, but number two, for the Assyrian to have power over him. You know, one time I was sharing many years ago, and I told people, the Assyrian is a spirit. And until you understand it, many Christians are beaten because they confuse short victories with the eternal victory with which we have in Christ. There are things that will happen in your life that might look like victory, but they're not victory with God. And there are things that might look like defeat in your life, yet they are victory in God. When Jesus was at the cross at Calvary, Satan knew that he had him where he wanted. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Eastern, and the Judists of his time knew that they had him where he wanted. But you see, they did not know that the Son of God was purchasing your eternal salvation. Victory in Christ is defined by us being in line with the purpose and will of our life. Are you in the perfect will of God concerning your life? Then victory is yours. There are certain things that might happen for a moment that might look like they are not victory. Yet to God they are walking a far way to your way of victory. Somebody said hallelujah. And indeed in the end the scriptures will come true. That all things work together for good for them that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, this is the confusing thing about the Assyrian. Like... For those of you who read the story of David, when David defeated the Assyrian, something settles on his head. The Bible says, and he stays back when kings go for war. That is how he sees a naked woman on his rooftop. And then alas for her, kills the husband and takes over her. But that was after the victory of the Assyrian. If you remember again, Haman was a Syrian. You remember that? Wasn't Haman? Right? He was a Syrian. He comes, the prophet heals him. Next thing we know, the servant of the prophet is following him to get the gains that the prophet had refused. And what happened? He, the servant of the prophet is smitten with leprosy because you don't receive from the Assyrian. He's one of the most confusing spirits I know in the Christendom because it confuses men to divert away from purpose in time of victory. That's exactly what happened to David. When he had just had victory, he stayed back when kings go for war. That's the Assyrian spirit. The thing that she used to seek God before she got married. The day she got a man, she stopped seeking God. Why? Because she got a man. He used to love God the time when he didn't have a job. But when he got victory finally and they started to pay him unreasonable monies, that was the day the man stopped seeking God because he got a job. It's exactly what I'm trying to tell you. It's a similar issue. It was purpose for the prophet not to receive from Naaman. Who are you, O servant of the prophet? To receive from who the prophet, the Lord, has not led to receive from. Again, the Assyrian. It sometimes spells the things that we are willing to do for shortcuts of gain when they are not in line with the will and purpose of God concerning our lives. Let me tell you, it doesn't matter how beautiful it is. If it's not in the will of God, let it go. Tell your neighbor, let it go. Are you, are you following what I'm saying? Same Assyrian now we have in this instance. But now has taken another shape. He looks like he can side with Asa to fight Asa's Judah's enemies. And indeed, he fights them. Immediately, when Asa has to pay uh, the Assyrian to give him victory, what happens? God tells Asa from today, Syria is stronger than you. Be careful who you seek help from. That's what I'm trying to tell Christians. Be careful who you seek help from. Chances are that some of the people and things that you look to start to become mightier than you 
when you don't know how to look to the Lord in time of trouble. And that's a lesson too. I know some of you understand. And some of you might not understand me. But that's alright. Maybe this man did not know. Clearly, Asa. He did not know that Syria was weaker than him. If God has said, I've given you Syria, the one that has frustrated Israel, it means you also had power to defeat Israel. I am the same God that was with you when you defeated the Ethiopians. Why? They might here. But he said, you defeated them. Why? Because you gave me your trust. You trusted me. You put your faith in me. You said, I believe in you to do this. I'm not relying on my own strength and ability. But then at the point where victory is somewhere and you know, success is there, prosperity is there, you get your eyes off God and now start looking to the things that you think give you prosperity or the things that have given you, you know, fame. You understand? You began with God. Are you hearing me? You get to a point, you get frustrated, but because you know everybody in town, you, it's easier for you to call that person to bail you out of a problem because you're connected. But, but who connected you? Where were they before they co got connected to you? Where were they before they, they got to know that you're a man or a woman of God? Yet that God was with you. He was the same God you trusted on border borders. He was the same God you put your trust in before you even owned a car or a house or, or even money. Before you began an education, he was with you. Now look how you get everything right. And then you start to trust in the arm of flesh. The Bible says Jesus committed himself to no man for he knew what was in men. We're talking about carnal men here. If you trust in the arm of flesh, the scriptures tell you it will fail you. Oh, apostle, I'm stuck. My guardian doesn't have fees. I think I'm not going to sit for exams. What? So all along your guardian has been your source, not God? Oh, now unbelief has come in your spirit because the guardian who has been paying your fees is not there. Where is your God? Hallelujah. Oh, we are not safe. I used to have security a couple of weeks ago, but now my security is gone. I'm not safe. Why are you not safe? Why are you not safe? Why are you not safe? Look at Asa building cities and building boundaries of cities because there is peace. Wait, are you supposed to build boundaries because you don't have war yet? Aren't you preparing for war? Hello? Hesa said, let us build cities, let us build boundaries. Why is he building boundaries while there is still peace? He's preparing himself for war. And Rambi, it will come. You know, while they've not yet attacked you, it's better you buy a gun. Buy it. Buy it, you'll see what will happen. Somebody shout hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Now, the Bible tells us, this is now God through the prophet Hanani, rebuking him, telling him now you've put your trust out of God and you've put it in men. Even the people you've trusted to help get victory, now they're all under you. What happened? Instead of Asa breaking before God, he put Hanani in prison. He arrested him. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. So I love this lesson that when he says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. This is the heart perfect toward God. You trust in him under all situation and lean not on anything that looks like it can bail you out. That's a man who has learned to trust God. Because now this was not the absence of a helper. This was the presence of an alternative. And Asa chose the alternative. And I've seen that sometimes we don't trust God because there are alternatives. You know, there are people who, who don't trust God because they don't know him. And there are people who also trust God because he's the only alternative. And then a time comes when they have another alternative. And then they choose that alternative over God. That's exactly what happened. And the Bible says in verses 10, Asa was wrought with a seer, put him in prison, uh, in a prison house. And the Bible says, for he was raged with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some people at the same time. That means I think he got the people who used to agree with the prophet Hanani and then also oppressed them. And the Bible says, and behold, the acts of Asa, first and last law, they are written in the book of the kings of Judah. And Asa in the 39th year of his reign was diseased in his feet. After that, he got a disease in his feet. 
Remember, he has opened up himself for war. He will never stop attracting war. That means from then on, wars kept hitting Judah. And he didn't even know why the wars can't stop, except that one thing, that he has disobeyed God, but he didn't even care to make right. Because the scriptures never tell us that that day, when Hanani was thrown in prison, and then wars started coming, and to her answer, he went to God and said, you know what, God, I think I know why these wars come through. Your prophet spoke it. No, he stayed adamant. In the 39th year, he got a disease in his feet until his disease was exceeding great. And the Bible says, listen again, yet in his disease, he sought not the Lord, but to the physicians. There is one every sight. The man has refused to go to God. When he falls sick, he remembers, oh no, I'm a multi-millionaire. I can pay any doctor the best research. You know, I can go to the best hospital in the world. You go. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says in the 13th verse, and Esther slept. That's a sad story. That's a bad finish. I don't even want to go deep into the work of the minister if the feet represent the gospel. I don't even want to go there because it's a very painful thing to imagine. But don't we know that feet sometimes are a figure of the preaching of the gospel? So the man's ministry got diseased in his late years of life and he died. A very ugly death, a very ugly ending. Why? Because at one particular point, diverse graces came on his life and he stopped esteeming God his helper. And he started to look to other ways of fixing the things that concern divine purpose. What do I mean by that? I have learned, and I learned this many years ago, that anytime anything happens to you, before you even seek anything besides God, seek God first. When you feel sick in your body, first thing you do, before, before you even call for an ambulance, before you, no, no, first talk to God about it. Parents, teach your children the same thing. Oh, mommy, I have a headache. Get panad. Really? You're telling your child the quickest option. Then after they swallow panado, now let's pray. Oh, so where is God? Where is God? God is number two after the panado. Who is understanding what I'm saying? There are many choices that we have made and some have bruised us so heavily because we did not seek the mind of God in a matter. There was a way God wanted to give Asa victory. There is a way God wants you to get that job. There is a way he wants you married. He has his way. Seek his way. Don't seek your mind. There is a way he wants you to do that business. Seek his way of doing business. Don't seek your mind. Don't go after what you think. Don't think that because you have a guy who has promised you a deal and is from America, therefore everything oh God. What is God saying? It's like ministers, ministry. When you decide to do ministry, seek God. How? Follow every step he has told you. It might be costly. Yes. It might not even make sense to those that are watching at that particular point. There is even a time where you might look like you're either crazy or you don't know. There are even times you can be in the perfect will of God and look like he left you. Are you hearing me? The most important thing is knowing that you have leaned your entire trust and mind on him, being fully persuaded that he is the God you had, he has spoken to you. If he has spoken to you, there will be no war with you. Some of you, the things that you're fighting with are maybe reverse a bit, Asa, before your feet get diseased. Reverse a bit and maybe go back and ask, how did these wars come? Maybe there was a time I switched off the voice of God. And these things are coming and I'm also fighting in my own human strength. But one time something comes and it will hit you. It is bigger than the enemy without. It's in your body. Why is it in your body? Simply because there was a point you started to see things that are really showing. Then maybe you've gone out of course, but you ignored the voice. The rest of his life, the man was hit with war. Maybe he had victory in those wars. But how many people died on those lines fighting for a man who had rebelled against God? How many people lost their lives? How many mothers were separated from their husbands and children were separated from their fathers? And some of those men died on the front line of war because one man had refused to go the way of God. 
But you see, it's easier when we are narrating it in a story until you put a little space in you and put the light on you to make sure that in everything you are doing, in every passage that you have with God, just make sure, promise yourself this one thing, that God, in every decision that I make, I need to know your way. When attacks come, you need to know how to fight. How does your word teach about this? What does the Bible say when a brother says evil about you? The Bible says, go to that brother. If you fail to reconcile, get another person and bring them. If you fail, bring a third and make peace. If they fail, yes, regard the person and say, you know what? Now I don't follow you because I followed all the right teaching of God concerning making peace. But then a brother wrongs you and when he wrongs you, what do you do? You also feel that you're vindicated to speak evil about the same brother or sister. What do you do? You go gossiping about them, slandering them, speaking evil about them, doing everything that you can. Why? Because you think that you're justified because they attacked you first. Yes, I understand. But was it the way of the Lord? Moses have called you to deliver the children of Israel. And I know that there is a calling upon you because you have seen me who is invisible. You have refused to be called the son of the daughter of Pharaoh. You have achieved a certain maturity of state. You have esteemed Christ's greater riches than the little few pleasures that are only for a time in Egypt because you've had respect unto the recompense. And here is another man who is Egyptian. You have a zeal in your heart to redeem the children of Israel. What do you do? You kill the man and then you bury him in the sand. And what happens? You flee from the hand of Pharaoh. 40 years God did not speak to Moses. He did not speak to him for 40 years because he sought another way to solve divine purpose. He, he thought in his own understanding to do the will of God. He buried a man under the sun. The voice of God stayed silent on that man. What caused him to go out of the will and purpose and the mind and counsel of God? Anger. The same old demon comes. God has told him you are going to take the children of Israel into the promised land. He tells him, speak to the rock. Speak to it. Instruction. Instruction out of anger. He knows he has the anointing. He smites the rock because he knows he has the alternative. And what happens? Water gushes out. God tells the man, you know what? You are not going to take the children of Israel into the promised land. Even though it was my mind and intent that you lead them, you will not lead them. He goes up the mountain, Nebo. He looks down. And that pain, I see the pain in Moses at that particular point. When the Lord will not let him. Yet his, his physique was still okay. His natural face was not abated. And his eyes were not dim. Yet he could not get in to, to fulfill the purpose of God upon his life. What was his problem? Anger. Simple anger. He stayed with a demon. From day one, he was the most humble man in the book of Numbers. But the Bible says, but he had a bad temperament. He was a man who had anger issues. He had, and some of you, it's those little small things. It's how sometimes you provide for anger and go out of the will of God on how he's supposed to deal with an issue. And then you put wars on your gate and for 20, 30 years, you're fighting things that never leave you. You think that the deliverance of a certain man of God saying, power, Holy Ghost, will deliver you. You pray, you fast, you go on mountains. But there's one thing you need to deal with. Thank God for his grace. Because it, re it teaches us, it teaches us to deny all ungodliness. It's ungodly to keep anger. If I want money, how am I supposed to get money? The principles are clear. If I want a career, how am I supposed to get a career? The principles are clear. There are also alternatives that are clear. But if I want to do things the God way, I have to make up my mind to do things the God way. There are ways of building ministry. There are ways. Men of God, if we want money, we can get it out of people. We can. But that's not the way to make God speak. Oh, the Lord has told me. That if you bring $70, 70000 from some 70 come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. The Bible is very clear that the heart of a man must be made up in their doing. When a man is to give, their heart must be made up. 
and it must be made up because they hear the Holy Spirit. You don't need to quote Psalm 70 or Psalm 62 for $62,000 and $620,000 or $6, only the figures of six. The Lord has told me, if you bring the figures of 50 or 50,000 or 5,000 or 500,000, whatever the Lord tells you, but the number of five, don't give less, don't give more. Come on! Why? Because the servant of God is broke. Do you understand what I'm, now? No offense. But you're seeking for a shortcut man of God. How long are you going to quote the Psalms for money? What did God tell you? Give and it shall come back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give to your boss or man of God? Do you give? Yes, don't worry. He shall supply all your needs according to his riches in glory in Christ. One lady called me one time, told me I'm being frustrated at work. I feel tempted to also speak evil about this person because they're speaking evil about me. I asked the girl, I asked her, do you tithe? Yes. Do you give your first fruits? Yes. You're a giver to God? Yes. Don't fight that battle. Keep quiet. Why? Because that's the way we fight. Let the seed fight for you. The seed will cry louder than the loudest noise you could ever make. That is why God ignores Hagar crying and then he goes to the seed of Abraham which is the seed of faith Ishmael and he hears it crying and he comes to Hagar and tells her weep not for the Lord has heard the tears of the lad. Your seed cries louder than any tears you could ever make. If you're a tither you're a giver. Listen nobody can take you out of work. If they fight you to the place where you lose your job, God can only take you out to bring you in to another level. I told her you have no need to worry. You're safe. Why? Because you're a giver. Listen, some of us were bankers as a banker for six years. Men, they fired people for all kinds of things. Not all the people that they fired were really thieves. No, it was just a mistake of sometimes overpaying by 100,000 or 200 or a million or 100 million or this. And sometimes you, if there's a thief amid his stew and then he tricks you into signing a paper. And then that paper sort of later they discover that it's a fraud. And then some of them ask you, oh, did you follow due diligence? Oh, I didn't follow due diligence because I trusted the person who gave me the paper to sign. Before you know that, the guy's in police, they are arrested, but you've not even done anything. And we worked in that kind of environment. But I remember every time I would enter this bank, I'd say, God, if a man brings a signature and it's not from you, divert their mind in the name of Jesus. Tell me I will not sign it. Oh, my goodness. All my years in the bank, I never stood before a disciplinary committee for anything. Yes, there were frauds. We would see them. But on the day when it's supposed to be a fraud, it's when the Spirit of the Lord tells you, walk away, don't sign that one. You just find yourself not signing because God knows how to watch out for his own. More of the story. Seek God in the way he wants to fix your need. Seek him in the way. I see young women who do... Th because you want God to give you a, a marriage and oh my God... Some of you, the things you do, you make shortcuts and why? You fight others, you, you hate others, you do this, you, why? What's in your spirit? But because you want a man. You bad mouth another sister because you want a man. You look bad because you want, what? what? Jesus. Listen, when you know God, they find you. Oh, let me say it again. When you know God, they find you find you. You don't need to manipulate somebody. You don't need to speak evil about another person. You don't also need to enter another woman's marriage to break it. Because then after you say, God is faithful. He, <laughs> how do you want me married? Tell me how. If you tell me to wait, I will wait. If you say 20 years, that's okay. I'm not under any devil and I'm not under any rush. You are God. If he refuses you, God is still the maker. He will mold for you another one. He made Cain a wife. I would rather die with her. And I, if he's, I, I would die with her. Listen, so you're limiting God to one woman? Which is not in my life I die. <laughs> what? God, I, I if I don't marry that one, I will die. What? 
Some of those I just want to get slid out. Pwah! I tell him, what are you saying? Why are you limiting God to one individual? What if she dies? You die. I either get this job or I die. What? You mean there is only one job in the world? Oh, you think you need a job to be rich? No! God is still God. Whether you have much or you have few, trust him. You don't need to make shortcuts for finances. No, you don't need to cheat. You don't, you don't need to. But locally, born again Christians, pay your taxes. Give to Caesar. Mukamatuyambe. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. He is God. He is God. Don't finish badly. Let me tell you, my people know, these guys who are so close to me, they know it. Sometimes they put me, oh, apostle, you need to tell us this. We need to do this. We need to do this. But they know me for one thing, that if I've not had God on an issue, I'll delay it. I will delay it. I will delay it until I delay it, until God says, do it. Do it. If he tells me don't, I will not do it. It doesn't matter how much option it looks like. If it is not the will of God, I'm not interested. Let me tell you, we have also made mistakes building relationships that have costed us so heavily. I mean, get to the level where you even ask the Holy Spirit, do you want in it to be my friend? Simple friend. If you don't want me to be her friend, I have no business having her WhatsApp number. Who has understood what I just said? Apostle Grace, I want to be your friend. I pray about it. If I have to visit that person, I have to pray about it. Yes, because I've been burned before. Hey, your fingers can burn. Those are my things of starting funny. Before you know that, this person is your friend. They, mm, they flash you down. The next one, they, mm, what for? But you're looking for friendship. Listen, if God hasn't told me to start a friendship, I will not. Yes, I don't need to be friends with the whole world. Ah, I can love all men by God, but they don't need to be my friends. I don't need 20,000 likes on Twitter. I don't need 15,000 likes on Facebook. I don't lose appetite because a man put the film down for my YouTube video. I know who called me. I know who is in me. I know who works in me. I don't care whether the man doesn't agree with me or they agree with me. I know who agrees with me most. I know who loves me unconditionally. He was there. He's there and he will always be there. Chimala. That's enough. You lose peace because they don't like you. Oh, oh, why doesn't like him? Why doesn't she like me? Why doesn't that person like me? What, what, what? If you don't like me, you don't like me. That's your problem. It's not mine. I love you with the love of the Lord. Are you hearing me? If you don't agree with me, that's fine. I'll eat my pork and sip my tea and sleep well because I know, I know who is with me. I know. Some of you are even selling yourself short because you need favor from people. Flesh, flesh. If they help you, wonderful. If they don't, that's okay. If they answer your call, good. If they don't answer it, don't lose peace. You have God. He is always there. His call is always ready. He's never busy. He didn't tell you to hang on. He is listening, ever present help in time of need. Some people call it, no, no, it's not pride. It's trusting in God. Let me say this in Luganda. Some people get to a point where they hold on flesh and blood. 
until they get to a point where they almost think that if this flesh or blood didn't help them, they're without God. No. You still have God. Look up. He's your helper. If she has refused to give you the job, that's okay. You still have God. Don't build human solutions, other options when God is there. Even in the time when you think you know how, and I've seen this again, the Assyrian comes more so on men who have done multiple results. Men of God. We have ways of getting so used to the anointing because we learned to demonstrate the spirit. We've gotten so used to the altar. Listen, five years now on this altar, 15 years preaching the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus, I have never gotten used to this thing. And I don't think I will. And you know why? Because the Lord warned me many years ago and told me the day you think you know me, the day you think that you're used enough to have your own way is the day you give to the highest level of carnality. Come or is yielded. Respect every opportunity that I give you. It doesn't matter how many times I repeat to give you this opportunity. Don't take it for granted. I preach every Thursday like it was the first day I preached. And you see it every Thursday. When I stand on this pulpit, I give my all. I've wept here. I've cried here. I've laughed here. I've danced here. I've done everything on this altar. But on every time I've stood on this altar, I've always begun by worshiping him. I've always begun pro telling my spirit and my head that it's not me right here. It is God. And I tell him, may I not ever get so used to your presence and your glory that somehow in the way, because of the gift on my life, I succeed in the operation of that gift and lose the purpose of the minister. Assyrian. Praise God. Thank God for Asa. We learned. Put up your hands and speak to God. You are my hiding place. You always feel my heart with songs of deliverance. And I am not afraid cause I trust in you. Lord, I trust in you. Let the weak say I am strong in the strength of the Lord. Let's sing one more time. Cause I trust in you I will trust in you Let the weak say I am strong In the strength in your life and you feel that you have gone the ways of alternatives except the Lord God talk to him right now and tell him God help me tell him God help me 
if in your heart you examine yourself and tell him God I, I did business on alternatives I built a career on alternatives I built marriage or relationships on alternatives I, I built and established ideas on options that were not you and I feel in my spirit that I should have chosen your way because it is revealed in your word. Tell him, God, help me. May God help you. Let walls cease from your borders. Let peace come in your life. For the Bible says that he is our peace. He has broken the walls that have been dividing us. He obtained eternal salvation. That is why he took away the law and gave us grace. That we will be certain that he's on our side and for us. And that everything we go to him with, he has an answer and a good plan to make you prosper. And not to harm you, to give you a future and hope that expected end. May God deliver you from shortcuts that appear like shortcuts. But are not in line with the will and purpose of God concerning your life. Father, we thank you because we've learned in Jesus' name. And all saints said, Amen. if you're sick in your body, receive healing. If you're here and you've never given your life to Christ, you're going to repeat these words after me. Say, Lord Jesus, tonight I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I believe that you died for my sins and rose again for me. Tonight, you are my Lord and forever. Amen. The message you have just heard was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, contact us on telephone number 41 466 4291 or email us at fenerocompala at gmail.com. You can also find us on the web at www.fenero.org or better still, feel free to join us every Thursday for our weekly fellowships at Uma Multipurpose Hall from 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. You can also catch the live stream at livestream.com slash Fenero. Fenero, make manifest.